Hello, everybody. Good evening. Woohoo! We are thrilled to be here in Berkeley. Um, I think a lot of you guys know my name is Kara Murtis, and I'm the director of the Documentary Film Program and Fund at Sundance Institute. And um, on behalf of my counterpart at Skoll Foundation, the incomparable Sandy Hertz, and a lot of people know her too, and as partners in creating stories of change, Skoll Foundation and Sundance Institute want to welcome you to the opening panel of the first Stories of Change Impact Lab, hosted by your very own Tomorrow Partners here in Berkeley. This is all new. We've never done it before. And we are kind of wildly excited about the prospect of bringing social entrepreneurs, storytellers, designers, technologists, and programmers together to brainstorm about solutions to global issues. And we also wanted to show off a little bit because the people you're gonna to meet tonight and hear from tonight are truly, truly incredible and really have inspired us. Over the course of this week, um, we have five teams working and ideas will be had. Relationships will be formed, um, work will be deepened, and new solutions will be invented. At least that's the plan, but we're going to see exactly what happens. Truly inspiring principles have their basis in possibility, the possibility of the miraculous, the possibility of a better day. And so I think of some of the social entrepreneur organizations that are gathered here. I think of Paul Farmer saying, healthcare is a human right. I think of mothers to mothers saying, we are going to eradicate mother to child transmission of HIV in our lifetimes. These are principles that we can live with here. So Stories of Change with the, Stoll, the Skoll Foundation is devoted actually to developing context and content simultaneously. The need originally expressed by Skoll was how to raise the profile of social entrepreneurs and their issues. And Jeff Skoll is actually a storyteller at heart. Um, and he recognized that storytelling is one of the most aggressive tools toward consciousness raising that humans have. So he and Sally Osberg actually came to Robert Redford about four years ago and at Sundance Institute with a hunch, which then became an idea, which then morphed into a partnership, and now here we all are today. We've actually been able to invest in deepening our connectedness by bringing social entrepreneurs into the world of storytellers and taking filmmakers into the world of social entrepreneurs. We are living in shocking times and we are challenged to rewrite the story. So to help us do that, we came to Tomorrow Partners. And I have the fantastic pleasure of introducing the founder and the creative designer of Tomorrow Partners, Gabi Brink, who is truly an inspiration to work with. So Gabi, take it away. Thank you, Kara. And thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, we at Tomorrow are equally as excited about this week and about our partnership with Sundance um, and the Skoll Foundation. Um, but this is a particularly exciting intersection where we bring together these social entrepreneurs and storytellers and we now subject them to the design process for a week, which they haven't been <laughs> subjected to. Uh, they've had a lot of these um, workshops um, in their five years of working with Skoll and Sundance. Um, and we're now taking them through this kind of structured and facilitated um, process for the week. And we hope that this is really going to be an interesting recipe. For us, this is um, new too. We haven't um, had the luxury of working so collaboratively with filmmakers and social entrepreneurs. This is a really interesting space for us um, and a, a very interesting combination that we um, think will... will um, you know, lead to, to great ideas that we're going to uncover throughout the week. Um, I'm curious just to get a quick vote on, on how many people here consider themse themselves designers. Um, okay. How about storytellers? Wow, you outnumbered us. <laughs> how about entrepreneurs? All right, so that's pretty even representation, and so several of you made your hands go up several times, and that's exactly how we think of ourselves. Um, I try to challenge um, us to think that we're all designers of sorts, and um, in all of the, the businesses and systems and um, anybody trying to uh, bring about change at large scale is a designer at heart, and so that is exactly what we're trying to tap into this week and um, try to channel, and hopefully introduce those of you who have not been exposed to a design process to kind of new ways of thinking and uncovering um, solutions that are really based in solid needs and desires 
and that are designed within constraints that make the ideas really executable and relevant um, and really, uh, you know, change making. Wendy Levy from our team will uh, go ahead and lead the discussion to really unpack this further and we're really thrilled to be here with you and this is a very intimate room. We hope that you will very much engage with us throughout this discussion and let's make this, a, let's make this an interesting exchange. When do you know that what you're doing is actually making some kind of impact? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? Can you design for it? And can you bring it to scale at an institutional level where there is very little change that actually happens? And so I've asked, we're gonna start here on the stage with some people who are working in these change-making environments every single day to talk about examples when they knew something was happening like that both at a small granular level and at a meta level. Take us there too, because we want to be inspired. I mean, frankly, we all want to know why we wake up in the morning. We all do. And so um, I'm going to start with Hebat Megan um, with you uh, from Barefoot College. Um, so what I said I was going to ask you, Megan, is to talk about an inflection point that you recall, that you remember when you kind of knew that something was happening here that wasn't happening before. What did that look like and feel like? Well, I think a, a good example of that is um, in a small way in a village. Um, we recently had a project in Zanzibar on the east coast of Africa and um, this is a, a Muslim population, um, a very, very, very poor community cut off from a lot of other things and um, after choosing the grandmothers and sending them away to, to India while they were training, um, out of the blue, I got an email from none other than the leader of the village, who is called the Sheha. Now, this is somebody that would have to go 45 minutes on a public transport old rickety bus in order to even get to a place where he could send an email. He's illiterate, so he wouldn't have been able to even write me an email. But he had gone to the big town in Zanzibar. He'd found somebody who could translate and write in English for him a proposal to me to rebuild the school in their village, to give it four extra classrooms, to be able to accommodate less than 100 children per classroom, if you can ima even imagine that, to be able to put solar electrification on top of those four classrooms, to be able to put rainwater harvesting so that there could be bathrooms built, in this school and so that girls over the age of 12 or 13 would continue to go to school as opposed to dropping out. What's extraordinary about that for us at Barefoot was to see that these programs that we're running that are about women's empowerment and about climate change and other weighty and heavy issues had not only empowered those women, but they were empowering the whole village. And that is quite a profound shift because you realize the power of one tiny spark to drive an entire village, men included, to feel there was the possibility that they could want more, that they could ask for more, and that maybe somebody would listen. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that's the best small example. Thank you. Were you going to go big? You had something that we had talked about earlier that jumped off into that. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. We, I was recently speaking in, um, in Brussels at the European Business Summit, and it was the first time they've ever included at the Business Summit a social entrepreneur in the, in the panel discussion. The panel discussion was on innovation. And... <coughs> It made me realize, coming off the Skull World Forum, how critical the voice of social entrepreneurs has become to solutions for sustainable and real impact and change, and how rarely we are included, in fact, mm. and that it is time to stop excluding social entrepreneurs as sort of this category of do-gooders who maybe have some impact and start recognizing that that impact is right now the most effective manner of change happening in the world. And that innovation in thinking and innovation in, in designing solutions that are real and actually are making impact in communities is coming from this sector, not the old sector. Um, and that really social entrepreneurs are becoming 
exemplar of, of innovation and, and possibilities for change. So I, uh, I'm really convinced that telling these stories, telling all of our stories in this sector is more important today because there are no good stories coming out of the other sector. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is where it's at. <laughs> Okay, that's such a perfect segue. Jeremy, could you jump on that for a second? As someone, because, you know, designers have to make a living, and working in this sector is sometimes hard. Maybe you could talk about how you've worked this change over the last five years. What's bubbled up for you? Um, I think it's a really interesting point that is made about the model of social entrepreneurs and social innovation. I come out of the business world, but a lot of the time it's business for change. And I think there's levels and layers, so we, we can't really lump it all together as a single thing. Um, I think you have the businesses that, like Paul Hawken, were started with a uh, social goal right from the very start. It was very much of an era, of a time, of a place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to see what happened with uh, him and Doug Tompkins and Yvonne Chouinard and all these amazing people really out of this crucible that, that was happening right around here at the same time is amazing. What's even more amazing though is what hasn't happened over the last 30 years or so and how the pendulum really swung to this uh, almost exclusively for-profit world uh, without necessarily much thought given to the impact the Amazon um, uh, example is just so telling about that where it's the short-term profit rather than the long-term goals. Where I see the pendulum swinging back is to find its way somewhere into the middle and, and what's really interesting for us at the moment is finding regular old organizations, companies, for-profit, multi-billion dollar companies that have at, as a core premise of what they're doing a commitment to community, to social innovation, to, I'll use that word storytelling, uh, as, a, as a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And we're finding actually some tremendous success working with those folks. What's challenging and important though for us is that we have necessarily to be conversant in both lands, or all lands simultaneously. We have to speak design with a small d. That view of the outside in, the empathy that comes from the design process. We have to speak business, bottom line, margins, um, business models, as, as Gabi alluded to earlier. And we have to uh, speak just humanity in the middle of it all. And it, it's, it's an incredible challenge. And, and as a group of facilitators, we've had the same conversation. We really only got together last night and this morning. And yet this, uh, this theme of conversation keeps coming up is how to affect systemic change through these massive organizations because there's a lot of talk right now about the little bets or the pivot or the, you know, there's lots of, of buzz around new ways of thinking and doing and I think it's really important to try those things but sometimes you've just got to go in and make massive change too <laughs> and, and I think that's where we're, we're balancing and we don't know and it was a big experiment and that's that's, I mean, that's just why we do it every day. Before I let you go, when you're working on a new project where change at scale is a goal, how do you know, what do you, how do you know that you're there? I mean, what, I mean, I know there must, there's some combination of qualitative and quantitative mm -hmm. um, assessment. What is it for you? It's just that sense in the gut, really, really. It's a lot of input. I think it's really about asking the right questions and you don't know whether it's the right question until you've asked it and have you, you have that aha moment. Um, but I think that is actually where the process needs to change. There isn't the kind of budget that we're talking about to do this deep and extensive work, nor can you in a state of con constant flux uh, know what the right answer actually is. So you're taking appropriate inputs, you're um, taking those outlier areas and, and, and recognizing them but giving them their place as you're focused on the primary goal and at some point you have to act. And I think this has actually been a, a bit of a problem for design in the past and, and why a new model is necessary. Um, 
there's a lot of great strategy, and it's not just design, it's advertising, it's management consulting, it, it comes out of all of these consultants, this outside-in perspective, and even every one of these examples given here, why are they working? Because it's inside out, not outside in. And I think this notion of we as the outsiders giving credence and credibility to those insiders and gaining that alignment as rapidly as possible and saying we don't, we can never be 100% sure. But then, and this is where we started out with this morning, at least then let's build that uncertainty into the process mm -hmm. with a plan and check-ins and an ability to actually uh, evolve it real time as yes. we go through. So the answer is we don't know. Right. Um, Corey, I want to jump to you. Great segue. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> go. <laughs> okay, well, I'm actually going to... Gonna... Know? What do you know? Corey's both an entrepreneur and a filmmaker. And so what, what's bubbling up for you as this whole conversation has evolved? Well, it's actually different than what we talked about earlier. So Great. I hope you'll just bear with me on that. Um, and, and I just want to start off by saying I'm working on the Partners in Health film, and the, the trailer that you saw is not indicative of the film. The trailer that you saw was shot immediately after the earthquake where we had a chance to go to Haiti. That was the kind of kickoff of our film, like, oh, holy cow, we're going to Haiti. There's been an earthquake. We were going to follow Partners in Health in the normal daily, you know, chronic disaster as opposed to this acute disaster. Um, and, and the film is not about the acute disaster of, uh, of the earthquake, although that, that is a factor. Um, so uh, I just wanted to preface it by saying that. And, and for me, um, as a filmmaker, following Partners in Health, they're an organization that really works. They work well. They, people are not often in peril if they are anywhere near the Partners in Health system. <laughs> they're like, they were in peril, and now it's about to to like, get healed for them, uh, which is a great thing about the organization. But we were making a film that was, uh, we were going to follow several partners in health, like some doctors, some patients, some, you know, kind of follow the journey. Um, and unlike a, you know, a war surgeon or you know, somebody operating without any resources or without a system in place, PIH really works on systems and fixing systems. And, we weren't going into places where the systems weren't working, and we were having a hard time finding our story. Uh, like, a couple of years of hard time finding the story. And um, so two things kind of happened simultaneously. We found a patient who was within the PIH system who was a little girl who needed cardiac surgery, and she was going to get cardiac surgery in country in Rwanda, which is what PIH does really well is help strengthen healthcare systems. And, and really, um, you know, so that this girl could have treatment within, within the country and, and the surgery fell through within the country and I'm following this girl and we're saying, wait a minute, I'm not, this is not going to turn into a tragedy and now you're going to see the social entrepreneur side of me. The filmmaker, if I was just the straight up filmmaker, would be like, I will just dispassionately film this and no offense to the other filmmakers, but I was like, oh no, she's, I don't care if we film this or not, this kid is getting this operation and so, what we did talk about is how we worked with PIH and with the Rwandan government and with amazing doctors and, you know, to kind of collaboratively come together to, like, forget about the film, like, let's get this group of kids from Rwanda to Sudan where they can have this heart surgery um, because the, the surgical team that was following in, uh, flying into Rwanda to do the surgery fell through and, and time was of the essence. So we got the kids to... Um, Sudan for the surgery and we were able to follow that and um, which is great that's a very dramatic thing for a film to follow kids having heart surgery but it wasn't really the story of PIH or what they do and so then I've got the whole rest of the film like what are we telling the story about so while the kids were in Sudan I ended up in a small um, small town in Rwanda with a lot of the PIH team including the, a lot of the characters that you saw in the trailer, um, Joya and Paul, and they were doing a global health delivery course, talking to uh, healthcare professionals in, you know, African healthcare professionals about different issues in global health delivery. And now I've been trying to like follow these different characters and their active character-based drama. It was not a historical film. It was like very much, you know, let's follow them in action as they 
encounter problems and solve them immediately. It's just not very fun. Um, it's like, oh, he has cancer. Oh, literally, he's cured of cancer two days later. Like, great, thanks, guys. I mean, like, it was like that. I kid you not. There was a kid that we were following for like two hours who had this giant tumor. And PIH had this, like, chemo that magically shrinks the tumor overnight. I mean, it seemed like magic to me. I mean, that was the kind of, it was Burkitt's lymphoma. He got on the chemo, and then this seriously giant tumor just, like, is gone. Anyway, we're at the Global Health <laughs> Delivery Course. I'm like, you know, and whatever. Uh, so we're at the Global Health Delivery Course, and um, Dr. Farmer is with uh, the health minister of Rwanda. And... We're shooting a lecture that they're giving where they're talking about the remarkable gains in healthcare and the dramatic drops in mortality in Rwanda, which I had not realized. Like, I've heard, oh, Rwanda's a success story, Rwanda's great, but like, what I did not understand, things like in 2005, eight women a day were dying in childbirth. Today, less than one woman a day dies in childbirth. I mean, we're talking about as a direct quote from Paul was, the largest, the steepest declines in mortality like ever recorded in human history. I mean, I think that's actually what Paul said on camera that day. But, um, and I sat there two years into my film, blown away in this like small lecture room in this small town. And I turned to my cameraman and I said, you don't realize what we're shooting is, this is history. And after the lecture, Paul came up to me and said, you realize this is history, Corey? Mm -hmm. And I said, and the camera laughed. He's like, that's what she just said. Like, you know, I was like, can I go on break now? But, you know, no, he's a lovely guy. But, but he didn't quite get it. But what I got was we have been making the wrong film. Like, we've been trying to find the drama. And, you know, it's what, what I want to lead to is the point of the importance of, for us of recognizing the revolution of um, health of just of um, you know healthcare and social justice has happened and needs to continue to happen, but there's a really important role to articulate what has happened. I did not realize I'm a wonk in a lot of you know in my group, and I did not realize what I can give you many more examples of what's happened in Rwanda where you'd be like really. Mm -hmm. Wow, that this has happened, and it was it's my job to tell the story of what has happened so that it can get credibility and be replicated and be scaled up, and tools can be designed mm -hmm. to you know facilitate this happening more, which is so exciting what we're working on here. But that you know, I think that we it, it is so important to pay attention mm -hmm. and to articulate what works, mm -hmm. what is working, and when we were doing impact research for PIH and interviewed so many people, they were like, oh, help us create a, you know, healthcare and social justice movement. We need a movement. Like, we need this big, huge thing. And I realized in sitting there and hearing Paul and, and the minister talk, oh my God, this movement has happened. Like, the revolution has happened. It's not over, but the South-South collaboration, the way that it's being done, you know, Haiti teaching Rwanda, and, like, this is a story that has to be told and will have massive implications when it is told. Mm -hmm. so. Corey, thank you for that. Jumping to Rena, I know you have a lot of experience in this field as a sort of out-of-the-box systems thinker. Can you add some of your past, maybe not necessarily what has happened this week for you, but some of the experiences from your past that really, I think, add and amplify what we've just been talking about? Sure. Um, so, so I came to design from the social justice world um, which is a somewhat unusual path. Um, I worked here in the Bay Area with grassroots um, organizations and, and uh, government agencies to, to create social impact. And then I went, I got my first Mac and I got involved with you know, politics in a, in a much more, um, you know, how do you leverage new media to create change and, and, and collection of action and people. And, um, decided to, to go to, to school where um, this whole thing was just blowing up around design for social impact. And um, as Gabi had mentioned, business has been hot on the trail of design, right? Because as you had mentioned, all these old world models at a standstill. 
they don't work. They've gotten us to where we are, not a great place. Um, they keep trying to solve the problems with these models. It's not working. So here comes this creative process design and there's a lot of sort of um, um, excitement about what the possibility is. And there's a lot of thinking around by what it is that design offers, um, the fact that for business, it's a lot around, um, you know, looking at your numbers and, you know, you, you lay out your three options given the numbers and you can do A or B or C, whereas design is, you know, what if you just create a totally different alternative? Um, and it's not selecting between A, B, and C, but what if you actually just understand the situation and then create, you know, W? Um, and one of the things that I love about design, but is also sort of a, a point to, to recognize is its sense of grandiosity. Um, and it has an epic sense of grandiosity. Um, and, you know, there was really this energy, and it's just every day is increasing more and more around what design can do for social impact and what can design can do for this space. And, you know, I'm with colleagues who are very well intentioned, um, but, you know, maybe don't, just when you get raised in the grassroots world, it's like imperialism is a consideration <laughs> in, in, in all its varied ways. And, and, you know, this idea of coming into a situation and prescribing solution um, and, and really coming with this notion that you have, you have the set of, you know, methods and process that's going to, to, to really kind of be the silver bullet um, is a little scary from, from my, my point of view in the design world of, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do as designers to check ourselves and to actually build in awareness around isms and all sorts of things. Um, but I also love design and I think that it does offer something very, very strong and, and compelling. Um, and one of the biggest, most compelling parts, which is very uh, intuitive and natural, I think, to the social entrepreneurs and the filmmakers, is this user's perspective, what we call the user's perspective, which is a very consumer, buyer, you know, paradigm we're talking about, but essentially, you have to understand the people that you're, you're trying to design for, and actually, it's not about designing for, it's designing with. And it's, it's, it's actually really just how do you enable the conversation and provide what tools we, we can offer to this situation, which is only one set of them, um, and is no more or less valuable than any other set at the table, um, how can you offer that to allow people to kind of go through a process and really own the process to come to their own solution of what they need? And I can go into a specific example, but I mean, yeah, yeah. why don't you give us one? Um, so uh, I think still one of the most profound ones is work that I did in, in a country of Qatar. Um, and it just keeps getting more and more exciting. It was um, really interesting because the business school at uh, Carnegie Mellon got is part of the whole system where you know government of Qatar is very very wealthy. Brought in six universities, and they want to transition to a knowledge based economy from a resource based economy. They've got a lot of gas, <laughs> um, <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. And so. Um, you know, the business school was as because they have this very powerful woman who is very much an influencer in that country, Sheikh Hamza, um, one of the king's wives. Um, they had a mandate that they had to have fifty percent enrollment rate into their um, entrepreneurship program, and they weren't getting it. Um, and so there was this: can design come in and help and see what the situation is about, um, and and you know, see how we can increase the enrollment rate. And it was really this sort of like, oh, you know, can you help sell it to women, you know? <laughs> um, and it became this much sort of, through a, through a lot of research, it became this much more um, uh, exciting project where it became very clear that in the country of Qatar, if they want to make this transition to knowledge base, they in fact need to rely on their women because the women get way more education than the men do at much better institutions, and they go for further education than the men do. And I mean like double the numbers, it's not just a slight increase. And these women are super savvy and really, really excited and, and just really want to kind of, um, they, they are making their own, own pathway. 
So we ended up working with the women in, in Qatar and have designed uh, a center for innovation and, and entrepreneurship. And, and the women that I worked with have taken it over. I mean, they're just sort of running with it. And I think that how do you know it's working? It's when that sort of moment happens of like, you design yourself out of the process. And um, maybe not intentionally, but it happens anyway, which is great, you know? Um, so. And to speak even more directly to that is my friend and constant disruptor, um, Joaquin Alvarado, who I'm curious really, because Joaquin has worked outside the institution, he's built institutions, and he's tried to sort of make change from within. And I'm curious, as this conversation has, um, has evolved in the numerous spaces, what's, what's in your brain right now? So I, you know, I, I, I wonder out loud at this very moment, um, you know, what do, what do we think the channel is, right, that we're creating here with these stories and, and this innovation? Um, because there are, there are existent channels, right, like you can make a documentary film and you can put it out there and some people can see it and some people can comment and some people can like it on Facebook. You can empower uh, grandmothers to get into the solar industry in a very profound and powerful way and that's obviously that work itself is this unit of change um, the equivalency of which on the social media front is hard to imagine right um, the power of that one woman in Jordan right equals a trillion likes in my opinion um, and so we don't have a lot of equivalencies out here when it comes to impact audience uh, storytelling narrative and I think one of the problems is we're moving from the Newtonian space of the industrialized world where information is commoditized in a certain way to this uh, very quantum sort of mechanical layer where lots of small jitters can equal these enormous forces and disrupt lots and lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we've gotten comfortable with taking uh, media forms that the West has largely developed and popularized and globalizing them. Right, that's like the Einstein approach. I think, like you take it out to the edge, and it still works in in some you know little bit of difference. But this space where small is actually the most important um, place to navigate, I think, is profound right now. And the largest internet project in the world is the Large Hadron Collider uh, in Europe. Right, it's bigger than anything anyone else is doing in any one place, um, and it's looking for the smallest forces in the universe that we can get to. It's also the largest individual sucker of power, and it's also the only place on Earth that might generate a black hole, which is, which is good. There's risk. <laughs> Bring us back to Earth. I'm, I'm on place. Earth. Um, so, so, you know, I, 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 of all the things that I've done in the last few years, the thing that sticks with me the most is I've been able to be on the board of TechSoup Global, which has this enormous network of international nonprofits and national nonprofits, and, and there's something very mundane about what TechSoup has accomplished, which is to create a sales channel amongst nonprofits where technology can be efficiently, effectively distributed, taught, and disseminated, right? We don't have that, there's no equivalent for that with storytelling, right? PBS in the United States doesn't do it, the BBC doesn't do it, HBO doesn't do it, you have lots of strong actors, Sundance is a, is a symbolic and a practical actor in this, but there is no equilibrium in the network right now. And I think that if, if the right design happens at the smallest scale, um, what that can do as a quantum jitter in this space is help to bring equilibrium to this disparate network that exists right now. The internet is obviously the way that it's gonna happen. Mobile is obviously the device in which you're first gonna feel it, right? But the economics of it, the methodologies of it, the form of it is not yet decided. And it's through these kinds of works um, this kind of collaboration, this is the Large Hadron Collider for finding those elements, right? And then once we find it, all bets are off, right? Because then you go from thinking about, well, we can't resolve all the stuff we know if we think about a point. But if you think about it as a filament, as a dynamic string, that's string theory, then all kinds of things make more sense and more things are possible, there's more dimensions to it. So I think we have to get a little freaky when it comes to our metaphors, but we have to imagine that there are new dimensions to our work yeah. and that there are different economics and that there's a new equilibrium that we have to find, we're searching for. Are you feeling this, people? What? Oh, come on, I know you are. Um, you guys are amazing. This is, it's your turn. It's your turn.